Okay, well, my name is David Malone. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker and a writer. What I've just finished doing was working for Universal Pictures, um, making a cinema release documentary on artificial intelligence. I, I'm really pleased for it. It's going to be a good film. It's called, um, I think it's going to be called We Have to Talk About AI. Okay. And uh, I think it's going to be great. And why do we have to talk about AI? Well, several reasons. The one is because um, if you don't, the conversation is going to be had by a lot of techie boys who are billionaires uh, who are going to decide what the future is because they know better than you. And having interviewed them, they really think this. <laughs> uh, so it's a kind of conversation where you need to get involved now because otherwise they'll have built it and it'll be too late. They like to talk about AI f for everyone. But when they say things like, well, AI will do things for you. Well, it will, but mostly it'll do things to you. And we already can see that. You know, facial recognition is coming. Um, and there's a company, I can't tell you its name because I get in trouble, um, Tatum for Work in the UK. And what they say is, our AI can identify, in a, in a huge crowd, it can pick out any individual and read that person's emotional state. You think, okay. Their strap line is, we will be able to tell if someone is in an emotionally heightened, potentially dangerous emotional state and get security to intervene before they do something. How do you feel about that? But That's how, slightly dodgy, isn't it? it? Slightly, yeah. Slightly. But in what way can people respond to that? Well, you could say to your politicians, wake the hell up. Because <laughs> at the moment, the politicians are doing nothing. I've, I mean, there are a couple of sort of ineffectual, not quite buffoons, but just intellect. They're just people who sort of, oh, it's going to be marvellous. Some very clever chaps came around and told me it's going to be marvellous and it'll be great and it'll be beneficial for everyone. And they're the gatekeepers. They're the people who are looking after things for you. <laughs> so if you leave it to them, you're sunk. But um, you still believe that politics sort of has control of tech companies? I don't think potential. it does at the moment. No, I agree with you. It doesn't. But it will need to. Um, uh, and the other reason, I mean, apart from that practical reason, is because the, what AI will be able to do poses really deep philosophical questions for us. I mean, the one that I asked lots of them about is, what is it you want from AI? I mean, what do you want when you think AI? And when you ask people enough, what they want is something that will do all of the stuff for them. It'll make the bed, it'll make a cake, it'll figure out how to get the cheapest flight. And we're talking about AI which, even if it isn't conscious, will be like being conscious. You know, those, they've got those little Google boxes you can speak to. And in the end, you end up with something that's almost the slave. It will do everything you want to do. It can't say no. You can be as rude to it as you like. And you think, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a machine. It's, it's, it's not... It's not you're not really enslaving it, it's a machine. But how would you feel about your child growing up interacting with a machine like that? It's, my worry is not that we harm the machines. I wonder what it does to us, our moral fiber, if, if you live in a world where you have a machine that's sort of like human and you treat it like a slave. Did you get the sense, though, that it was a thought-out sort of value-led or, you know, philosophical viewpoint they had, or it was just sort of uh, technology for technology's sake, they were interested in the progress of the technology rather than sort of how it drives forward, what it means to be bit, yeah. I mean, that's one of the questions, isn't it? And the answer was, some of them will talk to you about... Um, um, well, I'll give you some examples. I can't quote them word for word, or I'll infringe their copyright. So these are paraphrases, <laughs> and I can't tell you who either. <laughs> Otherwise, some lawyer will come and drag me out by the neck. Um, but I, I asked what, a couple of them. I said, "Well, these these machines will have to make moral choices. If you have a, if you have a, 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 an autonomous killing machine, and we have them, 
it's going to make ethical choices about is it right, you know, if, if there's a, 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 a terrorist that it wants to kill, but there are 25 children sitting around, do you kill the terrorist and blow up all the children or don't you? And humans will be out of that loop. We're in the loop at the moment, and there's a little switch, literally a switch, you can keep humans in the loop. When it comes to a shooting match, that switch gets switched off because the whole value of AI machines is that they react faster than humans. So if you keep a human in the loop, it's as slow as humans and you may as well not have the AI. So there will be really serious ethical issues, or even driving cars, you know. Do you program the car so that if, if a, a group of children run out into the road, do you mow down the children and, su and you survive, or does the car swerve off the road and embed you and your brains in a brick wall? And I said, well, who, who? And they said, oh, don't worry, we're gonna put, we're gonna program in values. I said, well, whose values? And the answer was, nice ones. Okay, that's a deep philosophical position, nice ones. I, I, you know, I think different cultures will program in different values. But who's deciding? <laughs> Do you have your own uh, ideas of why this urge to sort of outsource, whether it's morality or, you know, robots to bring up your kids? Why has that become a progression in which we're seeing? Yeah, well, a lot of people, uh, some of the scientists, I can think of one in particular, um, their answer is, well, humans are so rubbish at this. We are irrational and we have prejudices and, we'll make, and AIs won't have these things, except they will. Because we, they feed off big data sets of our behavior. So there will be some kind of prejudice in there, but you won't even be able to argue with it. I mean, there's, there's an AI that's used in America right now. I think 13 states use it, and it's an, it, they decided that they would have an AI, because it would be much more even-handed, to decide which criminals should get parole, because humans are so biased. And so this thing was making the decisions. This person, yes, that one gets parole. This person, no, goes back to the clink. And uh, a, an NGO began to look at this, and they actually went to court, and they got to look at the raw data. And it turns out black Americans were 13 times more likely to be denied parole by the AI than a white person who had exactly the same crimes. <laughs> so, but there's this notion that it'll be better because it's a machine, it'll be fairer. Well, it won't be. It'll be worse because if you made a decision I didn't like as a judge, I could, I could come and pick at your chambers and I could say, I want to know why you said that. You can't do that with an AI because the code is proprietorial. It's their private property. You're not allowed to know. And that's another thing that came out in the, the particular case I'm talking about. Even though they won the case to show that it was unfair, the company said, yeah, but you can't find out why because that's our private property. So there's a lot of questions which we need to work through now. And we need to be the ones asking because the money involved is stupendous. Every company in every country knows the people who get to the market first will own the rest of the world. I and mean, Putin said it, and he was right. And he was at some panel and said, whichever country cracks general AI will rule the world. And he wasn't exaggerating, everybody knows it. Are there examples of ways in which AI is helping us understand what it is to be human? Any positive stories coming out of this? Uh, there's AI? lots of positive stories. And, and it, is, it is another way of saying, well, what is consciousness? And what's the relationship between consciousness and self-awareness? And, and it's just making us understand the, the difference between those two things and, and the difference between being clever and being conscious. They're not, they're not the same thing. I mean, most AIs will be zombies, you know, like in the zombie films. They're really quick, but there's no, nobody home. Um, so it's, it's doing all those sort of things. There's, there's tremendous good, but I think we'll only realize the good if, if the conversation is had more wisely. Otherwise, it won't do things for you, it'll do things to you for someone else's profit. I mean, it's not a mystery, is it? I mean, you know. Um, and it is a, 
a transformative technology and people need to get involved. So that was what was fun about doing that project. Was. And your work is focused on documentary, uh, often tackling a lot of the why questions. Yes. Questions which are often sort of dealt with in universities or institutions, but you've chosen to do so through documentary. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a very poor decision from the point of view of becoming wealthy and well-known because the broadcasters have essentially abdicated that. And it's sad. When I started at the BBC a very long time ago, yeah. there were about eight or nine strands of documentaries which none of you will have, you won't have heard of any of them because they've all been cancelled. I could, I could name four or five. Um, and the broadcasters aren't, they were, they were deny it. There's been no dumbing down and we love these deep questions. Bollocks. They don't. What they want is spectacle and titillation and natural history. You know, will the little bear cubs survive? Let's watch. <gasps> this is great stuff, but ideas they're not so keen on. But you can still get them made and I, 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 I like I like um, ideas, and I like asking why. And, um, and although the scientists, they always say, well, we don't deal with why, we deal with the how and the what. Actually, when they're off the clock, they love talking about why. And you, you've done documentaries about why, why we are here, or why are we here? Yeah, yeah. Who has the answers to those questions? Who did you go about talking to to find out? Well, nobody has the answers, and that's what makes it fun. But what I tend to do is just to try and pick a question which I think is really an interesting one and then show that people come to it with very different uh, very different notions, very different set of assumptions and it's really that, it's, it's stepping back from the question and getting people to show you what their assumptions are. I'm not so much interested in their answers, it's, it's when you get to see well, what are the assumptions behind what this person says and that's where it's really interesting I think. Um, and that one was just, that, that series was, was great. It was, um, it just said, can you believe in meaning in the universe if you don't believe in God? They, they broke down to two camps. Those who said, there is, wake up and smell the barbed wire. There's no meaning. The, the sort of arch materialist reductionist. And then there were the religious people who said, there is meaning because God m makes their meaning. And I, I'm not, I don't believe in God. So I wanted to be in the middle. And what I found is they both ganged up on me. <laughs> <laughs> the religious people and the fund and the reductionists, although they're you know they disagree, they both turned on me and said, "Well, you can't have that." But I think you can, and I think there are there's a coming revolution in science, which is the project I want to do next, which I, I think we're on the cusp, but in a huge revolution. I think dualism, going back to Descartes, you know, which he ruled out. I think it's, it is coming back, and the scientists, even the physicists here, know it. I was speaking to several of them in the last few months. They're not willing to say it in public yet, but it is happening. Dualism is back. What's led to that radical change of re-embracing the dualism? Um, two things, I think. One is the role of information, and this is, this is what I'm writing about now. It's a project called RGB. Um, and it's, it, it's there's, there's this notion, and it's, a, it's an idea. It's not, that, it's not a conclusion, it's a, that we used to think the universe was essentially made of two things, matter and energy. And, I, and information or ideas was just a human invention. People are now beginning to wonder if information itself is as fundamental a thing as matter and energy. Which doesn't sound right when you first say it. But think about this. There is information in the code of DNA, is there not? It was there before you came along. But is that not considered to be part of matter? No, it's instantiated in matter. Because I can take that code and I can write it down on a bit of paper or I can enter it into a computer. And the information is the same whether it's in the DNA or on a bit of paper or in a computer code. Because I can program a machine with my program to build DNA. So the information was obviously in the machine, wasn't it? Because it was telling it what to do. And then a copy of that information in a different physical form is in the DNA. So the information was just in different forms, but the information was the information, wasn't it? It was in the DNA, I wrote it down on a bit of paper, and then I programmed it into a machine which could build the DNA which had the information in it. So this is what they begin to think, and it changes the story of life completely. It doesn't, it doesn't say 
all of our science is wrong at all. But it does suggest that, well, it suggests lots of things, but for one thing, it says that all causality doesn't flow from the atoms upwards, that ideas push, push the electrons around. Now that was ruled out since they can't, but it's back. Is it back? Is it a, <laughs> is it a, like, a new form though of like that dualism or is it back? It's a new form of dualism. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, there's the material world and then there's God. Okay. Not at all. But the, you will get scientists, I mean, I'll talk to Roger tomorrow, Roger Penrose and others who say very seriously that there's a non-physical dimension. There is that dimension, this dimension, that dimension, and then there's a non-physical dimension, a proper dimension in which ideas exist. Now, I'm not sure I can go that far, but fi proper physicists, mathematicians, biologists are saying this. So it makes it terribly exciting because you couldn't have that conversation ever since they got. So you're talking about a revolution of at least 400 years, aren't you? And what would they look at as the origins of this? Of that ask them, they don't know yet. But they're staying up very late thinking about it. And it's, it's great fun. And what, I'm, what I want to do, I'm trying to write a book and make a, try to get a series funded, retelling the story of life. And that's what the project RGB is. Um, RGB just stands for red, blue, and green. Because you can tell the story of life in this story of a dance between matter, energy, and information in three chapters because for that to work, you have to power it. I mean, matter gives f a body, I mean, it gives form to information. Like you said, you, the information's got to be somewhere, isn't it? If the information decides what, what that form will be, and then energy's got to power it. You don't get nothing, you know, something for nothing in the universe. And so the structure of the story I'm trying to tell is that there have essentially been three chemicals which have powered that dance of matter, information, energy, um, water, blue world, chlorophyll, the green world, and hemoglobin, the red world. So you can tell, this, tell the story in three acts. Um, and that's from, that's the project I'm doing now. It's so say we accepted that information was a separate entity. Mm. What now can that radically change? Well, yes. I mean, one of the things I think it really does change is what kind of creatures are we? I mean, it's been for a very long time we've been seen as the robots that walk around so that our genes can express ourselves. And there is no such thing as free will and consciousness is about as useful as the froth on the top of your beer. It's, it's an epiphenomenon, it doesn't mean anything. And the self doesn't exist. You think it does, but that's your loss, it doesn't. That's the standard story. This would change all of that and say, that all still exists, all of that matter and all of the causality that flows from atoms upwards, still there, but there is now causality that comes down from the top from ideas. And when you get a form that, in, that gives physical form to ideas or information, that physical form, because it instantiates the ideas, those ideas now have an impact. So it changes our view of ourselves quite radically. And it brings free will back, or at least it opens the door wide open to free will. Um, I think it it does give a very different notion of what the condition of being alive is. And, I mean, people are now talking about panpsychism. You know, that consciousness isn't something produced by the brain, but is, as, as, is a property of matter, perhaps. And I, I'm not sure I believe that, but people are really talking about this stuff now. Um, and I find that quite... It's a great time to be alive. I mean, you know, instead of being all these questions, you can't talk about them. Yeah, you can. It's great. <laughs> but what what is what what is that shift that's like made people talk about it again? I think it's the, I think the shortcomings of the standard story. You, you get to all these things which are your the phenomena of your life. Like you say, I am conscious. And I'm me, I'm, I'm aware of my consciousness. There's a me inside here. And the standard story keeps saying, oh no, those don't exist. That's folk psychology, you think it does, but it doesn't. You think you're there, but you're not. You think you're conscious, but it's just a trick of your genes. And, you, and, and I think people have lost faith. And science 
is, I'm not saying it's religion, but faith is a very important thing for scientists because they have to have the faith that they're not wasting their entire life on a theory which is going nowhere. Most scientists, if you get to it, they don't like the word faith, but they have to have faith that that is a good thing to commit their lives to and not that. And people have lost faith in the story which keeps saying consciousness doesn't exist, self-awareness, the self doesn't exist. Um, I think they've just sort of said, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. And, and also the whole business of causality running from the bottom up. It just is beginning to look weak enough that you should be able to question it. It's no, a, a lot of people are saying it's not good enough just to, for you to say, oh no, you can't talk about that. And that's great. It's, it's, it's great that you can now talk about those things. Um, and I think it does, I don't know what the answer will be. It might, might turn out that it's all wrong. I doubt it. I think at least some of it will be right, but it changes massively the way we think the universe works. Where to go from here? How do you research? Um, what, me? Yeah. Well, I mean, I... I you seem my... quite sceptical still of like panpsychism or the idea that it's like an abstract Well, one of my, realm. one of my very, very close friends is writing an enormous tome on panpsychism. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Ian McGilchrist, who I think is a brilliant man, and his last book, The Mastery and His Emissary, I think when history comes to look at it, they'll go, Freud, Jung, skip everyone else, McGilchrist. Maybe other people don't think that's true, but I think it is. I think it's the most significant book written on consciousness for a very long time. And he, he wants to put this view of panpsychism. And everyone sniggers at panpsychism, and I find it difficult. But when you actually look at it, your choices are consciousness, which is unlike any other part of the physical universe, is magic somehow produced by matter. And it's just a somehow, it's just a, you know, a sentence, and then we get to the word somehow, and then we skip over to consciousness on the other side of the somehow. We have no idea how. how. How is it that some form of matter, which in all other forms, like that or this, isn't thinking, but then I arrange it in some way, and it's just go, doesn't just process the information, somebody's home. I'm conscious. And that is... There's no, zero explanation for that, which is why the standard story says, no, you're not conscious. There is information being processed and it fools you into thinking you're conscious. And panpsychism says, maybe a way around that is to say that the universe really isn't the way we thought it was and that matter isn't. Some things are just part of matter, like mass. It's not that you have to get a certain amount of matter together and then mass comes into existence. It just is, like from the very start, isn't it? It's, it's the fabric of the universe. So why couldn't consciousness be like that? And then what we're arguing about is certain kinds of consciousness express themselves in a way that we can interact with. We can interact with it. Whereas the consciousness in that hill over there, it's conscious in some sense, but it's not it's not wired up in the, in the way that I can ever interact with it. Now I find that, it's, it's like dropping a depth charge to water, my brain goes <laughs> But once I've got past that, what are my grounds for saying, oh, that's rubbish? I don't think I have any grounds. I find it difficult. But that's not good enough to just sort of turn your back on it and walk away. Um, and that's what's so interesting at the moment is from Descartes onwards, everyone said, look, we'll lock those things in a cupboard and everyone should just walk away. And everyone, some people now, you know, really notable people have gone back, opened the cupboard and said, let's have a look at these things again. <laughs> it's great. And do you feel like there's an opening more in science, which has traditionally been seen as like looking for objective knowledge or objective truth? The problem with that question, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's a great question, but the problem is um, the, the way that those two words, objective and subjective, what they mean, comes from the old paradigm. So it's very difficult to not import the old assumptions with those words, isn't it? Because it, it sort of says objective knowledge is truth, that's always true, and subjective is just you made it up. 
and ever since quantum mechanics, it's the dirty secret of quantum mechanics, these objective subjective just doesn't seem to be like that. Objective is springs from the stuff of the universe and subjective is something that comes out of the human mind. And those, we're going to end up with those two definitions changing. Um, because if somehow the stuff that subjectivity is made from, either consciousness or information, is part of the physical universe, then that, you can't sort of say there's the physical universe over here and that's subjective and then we've got this frothy, rubbishy stuff over here. They get collapsed together and we don't have a word for it. That's, I think that's what is so interesting is we, we've spent 400 years using those words to explore what those assumptions that those words come from entail. And we've come to a point where those assumptions now have undermined themselves. And you could end up with people really re coming up with new definitions of our, some of our deepest assumptions. Um, so I think you're, you, you hit the jackpot. I think you're alive at a great time. Is it, is it possible? Do you think humans will come to that point where we, we understand these questions? I think we'll come to a point where we understand them very differently from the way we do now. You know, I, I, I love reading history. And if you go back and read the stuff from the, the late medieval period, you realize that you're reading the words, but you realize that what those words meant to the people then is not at all what it means to you because you're on the other side of a transition and that's what's going to happen to us, I think. Um, and to be alive while the transition's happening, crikey, you won the jackpot. <laughs> um, and just a few more quick questions for social sure. media. I wondered if there's any musicians, filmmakers, uh, authors who have inspired you in your work that you would like other people to read, listen to. To read? Do they watch. have to be alive or? They can be dead or alive. I think people should read Erwin Schrodinger's What is Life and What is Consciousness. Um, two short things and absolutely brilliant. You should definitely read Ian McGilchrist. Um, it's a bit of a tome, but it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Even if it's wrong, it's so fertile. It, it, you, a hundred questions pop into your head from reading it, which gives you something to think about. Um, filmmakers, the two filmmakers I suppose who've influenced me the most would be my dad, whose shadow I have always lived in. He was a really great filmmaker. Um, he, he did um, Cosmos with Carl Sagan and he did uh, The Scent of Man with Jacob Bronowski and, and those were the kind of films I've always aspired to make. I've rarely been able to make anything like them, but they're what I admire because they, they ask big questions. Um, and I suppose contemporary ones, Kevin Hull is an overlooked filmmaker. He's a wonderful filmmaker. He made a film called Einstein's Brain, which was just a wonderful, brilliant film. Um, and I suppose f filmmaker from a human point of view, John Pittman made lovely, lovely films. He died not long ago. Um, and I admire those filmmakers because they were, um, they were interested in ideas and they were very honest. Um, uh, a, a lot of filmmaking now, um, the people who hold the purse strings don't allow the filmmakers to do what I know they want to do. I mean, I, I, I worked with young filmmakers who, when I've been in front of the camera, um, and they really want to make more um, challenging films, films that grapple with ideas, and they're not being allowed to. And I find that sad. Um, I think it will change because I think the broadcasters are dinosaurs and they're dying on their feet. Um, I've been saying this to them for 20 years, which is why I'm not on their Christmas card list, but it's true. Um, but I think what is happening is people outside broadcasting are beginning to fill that gap and say, you know what, you're wrong. It's not just Fantasy Island or Big Brother that people want to watch. There is an appetite, but it'll be, I mean, it sounds silly to say, it'll be more like the Renaissance where you had people who wanted to be a benefactor of an artist, a painter, a sculptor, a thinker, and I th think, for better or worse, I mean, it, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, I think that will begin to happen. For more debates, talks, and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.